wholeness and balance vibration to everyone and thank you for tuning in. This is an amazing time for us all. Of course, we're really a few hours on this time zone away from 2012. And of course, there's some major expectations for these dates and times. And uh, I will just have to clarify now that there are some people already on the other side of the world that are experiencing 2012 and they're still here for all of the doom and gloom and things that have been predicted for this year. So this is a really massive program that I have to de deliver today because um, obviously I've gotten a lot of questions during this time about what's going on with 2012 and you know what should we expect and what can we do to be prepared, et cetera, et cetera. And of course I've answered all of those questions which has led to me pretty much redundantly saying the same thing. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to do this video today that's going to give everyone the entire spectrum of what's been going on at least for the last i believe about eight thousand years or six to eight thousand years so that's going to give us a really uh good reference points for for where we were and that should hopefully be able to allow us to propel ourselves to where we need to go i will say first and foremost that all battles begin within and they end in the same place when we act out into the physical reality, that's an entirely different thing. That's going to actually get us kind of tied into all of what that entails. So today, of course, will be the lesson of letting everyone know what is going on in the physical reality. Um, I also didn't want to be in like a huge rush today as if I'm on a show, even though I am filming this on the fly. But um, I really wanted to be able to translate the message to you. A lot of times when these cameras cut on and things, you get a little nervous and you don't want to mess up. But I really wanted to, like I said, relax during the conversation so I can transmit all of the information to you. Because you have to see that when you really look in the past of what's been going on with the masses, as it's given that term, or the, the, the large amount of people, or the disenfranchised, as they say, is that... All of what has been happening for the last three or four thousand years has made a dramatic change. And what we're now experiencing in our reality is that we're actually free to do many things. You're, you can go out, you can learn, you can go to the library and you can, uh, you know, communicate with people on the other side of the world. You can do different things. It just all depends on your on your will. And that's something that in the past that it appears that there wasn't much exercising of the will meaning that humanity chose at a certain point to give their will away to something else. And that became detrimental for them and actually caused an extinction in the state where ignorance started to purvey everything. And so we have to see that our past has this darkness to it, just like any womb does. And we need to now learn how to use that for the fertilization of where we're going to be going. Um, to not forget about it because we actually have learned from it and we can stand upon it like a foundation. So, of course, a major part of 2013 is going to be really the resistance, checking a lot of the factions that are actually working with the controllers knowing and unknowingly. And what I mean by that is that, of course, there's been a lot of prophecies about what is going to happen in 2012 at the end of the year. And, of course, we've always let people know that 2012 can happen at any time. It's not a specific date. And that awakening, just like um, if you notice in 1999, there was this whole prophecy that the world would end. And then when 1999 was over, then they invented a new date called 2012, even though the, the timelines and the numbers don't even match up to the procession of Venus. People are told that uh, that this has to do with the Mayan prophecy and and uh, and all of what that entails. So we're definitely going to have to get into the Maya today and we're going to have to get into the Lemurian Empire. And we're going to have to take a really deep look at exactly how the priestcraft has been transforming itself over time. Just so the people still remain subservient and giving up their energy, which we really want uh, humanity to stop doing in order for them to fully realize their potential, meaning that in order for you to fully activate into who you are, you have to be able to to sustain your energy and not give it up to some other God or to something else that you think is higher than you or more perfect than you. So let me look over my notes really briefly here because I do have notes. Like I said, today's uh, program is really large in, in the extent of it's a lot of information to cover, uh, even though it's only bundled into about 15 or 20 minutes worth of pictures, 
But what also um, we'll find inside of it is that there needs to be an in-depth explanation about what people are looking at. So that's what's going to take us just a little bit longer. So, of course, there's been a major loss in time and energy here in 2012 with everyone running around trying to figure out what's going on with um you know, the, the comet strike or the planet X or uh, the aliens and um, all of the different things, the three days of darkness and all of this stuff that people have began to predict just in thinking that the prediction trend is for them, meaning that prophecies have always been to me for profit. If you really understand what what goes on with prophecies and when someone says something is going to happen in the future, especially if it's a negative, then that faction or those individuals have the opportunity to benefit on the individuals uh, in between the time of their prophecy taking place. So if someone pro uh, prophesies doom and gloom, then everyone changes their mind, changes their budget, their diets and everything based on that there's going to be a great doom coming. I'm more than sure there's thousands of people that you'll find that spent very heavily and, and uh, were very careful careless at towards the, the end of this year, just on the notion that maybe this may be the end of the world. So now in January, uh, as they say, after the fiscal cliff, they're going to have to look at reality again. And this time we want it to be a change for what normally happens. I will tell you now, words such as mass in, uh, in etymology are really connected to more of a ritual uh, actual ritual of death. And that's why you'll see most of what takes place uh, in regards to this level of the occult, especially what was taught to the Mayans, take place in December. If you notice, every time there's a new year, it takes place in December. And December is a very important month from the sense of you have to know what DEC means, D-E-C means. And D-E-C actually means 10. So despite what we think of as our 12th month, of course, um, because deck means 10, it really makes it our 10th month. And because Nov means nine, November is our ninth month and Oct means eight. So October is our eighth month. So this kind of inconsistency with how we think of time and, and how we understand where exactly we're at is what really the so-called controllers are playing on. So I really want to tell people today that we'll, we'll um, discuss the mysteries behind life while simultaneously uncovering the priestcraft of demigods and priests and overlords and servants and monarchs and vassals and lords and uh, saviors, and disciples and slave gods and worshipers and pharaohs and enochs and shepherd kings and sheeple. That we have to pretty much run the entire gambit in order for us to fully begin to progress. And I can see that clearly now, and I can see that also as part of my mission here on the planet. So let's see here. All right, I have a clip running here. Okay, so what I'm going to do briefly here is I'm going to um, get some things going here for us uh, to take a look at. Of course, this is going to be a fully animated program today as far as exactly how much... Um, content that we do have available for the show. And of course, this is all part of the new AstroClash platform, which allows us to, to show pictures, video, and any kind of media simultaneous to as we uh, or simultaneous to while we dissect it. And uh, that's become a big help for a lot of people in getting the clear picture, just to know that, you know, we're not trying to tell you something that's not going on, that's not or that's not happening. But we're definitely trying to get you in the know also, it's a very mature conversation today. I will say that why these clips are loading. This is adept level stuff, meaning that if you know you have a, a mental or physical or spiritual issue and you can see that actually happening or acting out in your life, this may not be exactly the program that you want to tune in. And that knowledge in itself, and let me uh, stop this here, that knowledge in itself was uh, split up into three forms. Um, in many cases, this is like the Trinity itself. There is the, the death, there is the life, and there is the, uh, the sustain or the sustaining component. So this forms what they call a trimurti. And if you notice in the ancient tradition, there's a lot of Trinity type behavior going on. There's, of course, Solomon, which means three sons. There's, of course, the, the, the mythos of the, the Old Testament, which is the, the son, the father, and then the Holy Spirit. And so there's this trinity that existed on the third dimension, uh, in, on the third planet, because this knowledge is that of a prism. 
Uh, I always liken the word prison also to the word prison at times because they're actually the same word, but it basically means a, a crucible or a place where things are cultivated. So what happens here in our reality is that if we're in this prism and we don't recognize that there are seven colors or seven colors in the spectrum that come out and try to divide themselves to look like different things but are in actuality the same thing, then we get caught up in the illusion. So to make that very clear to everyone, if you're familiar with the image of the triangle and then light being shined into the triangle and then um, seven colors appear and they say that because of this, they can see that this physical realities are made up of seven colors and seven core vibrations, etc. And um, I won't say that that knowledge is really authentic. What I'll say is that that is a specific belief system. And this is what people have to see that all the numbers that we're using, one, two, three, four, five, all these numbers are actually symbols and they actually mean something. And they were used to write down ideas, not just a specific counting like four beads, but an entire concept of what the next level of progression would be. So we have to see definitely very clearly that a lot of um, the symbolism that is being used today is being misinterpreted in the sense that there's an externalized interpretation going on. So we first have to kind of begin with the externalized interpretation of the planet Venus. And um, this is what I have here today to show just how far back this goes. Of course, it goes back before the Sumerians. The Sumerians actually the beginning of the Atlantean Empire, by the way. So it actually goes into the Lemurian Empire as the worship of Venus. But just so that you can see it here, because the symbolism is replete. What you'll see here is the crescent moon. Okay. You'll see here arrows. You'll see here an eight-pointed star, which is known as the Star of Ilu. You'll see here a cube. You also see dogs here as the covenant is with the dog or Anu. And you also see the procession of those who are known as the Anunnaki. And An is a word that come that means uh, came from the sky or the sea because the sky was synonymous with the sea. As you see the, in the daytime, they, they're both blue. But there was a, a heavy symbolism between what was in deep space could also be found in the deep ocean. So as we continue here, you'll find that what the Mayans inherited from, in the, in the sense, Quetzalcoatl, in the Aztecs, Kukulcan, what was inherited was the actual knowledge of the procession of Venus. And the reason why this was important for the ancient people was Venus gave them, especially on Earth, but Venus gave them more or less a compass to what was going on in the stars like you could literally count how many processions we were going through by counting the procession of venus and this is why right away you'll find that the cult is riddled with venus numerology venus symbolism pretty much all belief systems have a venus component going on within them and this is also known as the queen of heaven and so the, this knowledge is about that this procession that goes on in the sky with Venus, which touches every node of the constellations of, of the, uh, the universe, or excuse me, the solar system, actually forms out this, uh, this pentagram or what is known as phi, because the difference between this being a pentagram, let me make sure I have my screen up here, yes, and uh, of course the straight line pentagram is this is more of organic meaning that it's an actual celestial body making this pattern, even though I've also discovered that even when satellites are, are, are released into space, they start to make this pattern also, uh, giving us the, uh, the big question of, is Venus also a ship just like the moon? So what we have going on here is we see that this procession of Venus is the route to where we get the symbol, the pentagram. And everything that it stands for. And of course, because Venus is in it's upside down position, meaning that according to how planets, like you see Uranus is on its side, Venus is actually upside down, giving us the symbol of an actual inverted pentagram. But again, understand that these processions have a lot to do with calculating time on the ocean and the sea. 
And the reason why this becomes important for any seafaring people such as the Phoenicians or anyone who came from space or across the seas, because remember most of the uh, ancient people thought that the earth was flat, the indigenous that were living here because it appeared as flat when they looked out upon it. So the only people who really knew that the earth was round was those who traveled the seas. In order to travel the seas, you had to have a high level of nautical capability. And that nautical capability came from utilizing the, the Venus, uh, the Venusian pentagram and the progression of Venus. And so this, of course, is one of the roots to why Venus is worshipped uh, heavily, especially because the people who are instilling all the belief systems of worship actually um, uh, use the, the use the tool, the compass rose, the rose itself is it meaning sub rosa at times is this, uh, the terminology that they use meaning under the rose, but rose, the, the red rose is a symbolism for Venus. So what you'll also find is this particular symbol in Sumerian is very important for us to remember now. It is where we get all of this eight pointed star symbolism on the hierarchy of the world, the so-called controllers as I call them. And they wear a great deal of this, as we'll see later on, this kind of regalia with this eight-pointed star on it, which is known as the star of the Ilu, which comes from Babalu, uh, which is, of course, the first civilized city or when civilization moved into that sphere of the world. So let's keep going here. As you can see, it's... Uh, it's really going to get intense as we start breaking this down. But as you see here, the compass rose itself is a major symbol uh, used to denote being able to travel the sea. So this, again, goes with um, the information that I just released to you about how Venus was synonymous with trekking the sea. And later on, when this starts to become synonymous, synonymous with trekking the sky, meaning that an individual is supposedly in a spaceship and cruising around, you can see that this symbolism is still used. Okay. Now, another thing about the procession of Venus, because she's known as the, the queen of heaven, because she goes around all of the stars, of the major stars and planets at a certain point in a certain conjunction. And this is known to be like a mating to uh, the ancient people. This was the actual merging between uh, flesh, or excuse me, spirit, and another spirit, which is symbolized by the Sri Yantra, or symbolized by what we call the Megan star or the hexagram. So what you'll find with this symbolism is even the most ancient cultures, which you'll still find that Islam is a part of, use the symbolism that is related to the crescent moon and then the star, the pentagram, which is actually Venus. You'll find here, of course, uh, this is uh, Hafifa, I believe it's Abu Hafifa, which was the, the cherub that Muhammad rode on to the celestial mansions as it's recorded in the text before the Quran. Uh, but as you see here again, the crescent moon and the pentagram. We find here also an ancient picture of Venus before it was degraded into the woman with the red dress with the lipstick. Venus was originally seen as a very voluptuous woman because all of the entities that existed back then, especially the Nephilim, were very large. So in order to come out of the womb of their mother, their mother was seen as being very large to be able to carry them. So there was never really any idea uh, in the beginning of Venus being some type of... Um, <laughs> like a porn star, porn queen, or something of this nature, which has been turned into now. You also find uh, here again, this tassel was also the same bust, or one of the, uh, excuse me, the Venus of Lasso was one of the oldest, um, excuse me, inscriptions or engravings or carvings of Venus. And you notice something here right off the bat if you're really paying attention. You see here the horn, of course, which we can see why that symbolism is uh, present later on when we get into one of the real stories of what's happened here on Earth. Earth, But notice also the elongated skull and even the skull that appears to be somewhat reptilian-like. And this is uh, something that I believe connects to what we now call the hive mind queen. we find these elongated skulls is not being something very exclusive, but being found all around the world. And in many cases, 
when they're located, of course, they're being worshipped by the people that are there. And those people say that they were the actual skulls of the first fathers and mothers that were here on the planet. And everyone has to also remember there were mothers. Why so they give the story of the Nephilim and the Rephim or the giants so much, they never talk about the female giants or the Amazons, which fought alongside of man and woman at times, which uh, even became cloaked under the symbol of the Valkyrie. But what you're dealing with here, again, is uh, elongated skulls, which show an uh, excessive uh, pineal gland, meaning a larger pineal gland, and also um, a fully developed lobe, meaning that the reason why the human mind is so small at times is because actually the size of the cranium being somewhat premature. And that's why a lot of the indigenous people would attempt to shape their heads into the heads of what they called uh, their brothers and sisters that are arrived from the uh, the sky or this was again was synonymous with the sea and my knowledge has led me to believe that they came from the center of the world because that is actually the womb of this world is the center of the world and this of course is contrary to many people looking out in space for something but i can see any organic as you'll see with a woman the baby comes from the womb so anything that is coming into this planet will actually emerge from the center of this planet and then come on to land from that direction. And of course, this gives us a, a good insight into Hyperborea and Shambhala, et cetera. But what we find here is we find a glyph that is very rare to obtain. In fact, I know this entire lot was uh, destroyed. I was able to extract it from a, a, a museum site and, um, and begin to start pulling apart a lot of the symbolism that is here. But I only want to bring light to really briefly the elongated skulls. This uh, actual glyph or artifact is something that I call the arrivals, which is something where, where you can see that man or what would be man and woman are located here. And their stature is about the so to the size of the feet or to the top of the uh, legs of these beings. So this lets us know that as far as stories of them being the creators, what would really happen here is you could see that we were already created in a sense. They did arrive here and this began an evolutionary process. And uh, so that's what we see as the arrivals. And this is still, again, the Atlantean uh, Empire. I'm yet to cover the Lemurian Empire, which came before this actual arrival of obviously the An, Anunnaki, Ari or Ari, Ario, aristocracy, archi uh, archaeology, architecture. The the R is what you're would be you what you would be dealing with here. Also, you see again the symbolism is replete. We have the pentagram, and this of course is something from Egypt, and we see that there's an interfacing going on between this god and Venus, which is the pentagram. So we see that when you understand this priest craft, you can really interpret all of the symbols of what is being shown that normally doesn't make sense to most people. We find the original idea of the Black Madonna, Venus was always seen as black, as I said, it's Aphrodite, which is where we get our word Afro from. And then the child, of course, who's Amor, which is the, of course, the Latin word for love, uh, excuse me, the Latin word for uh, Barry, excuse me, also uh, love. Amor, which is, of course, connects to Roma and, and Rome and Venus, uh, Venus's child, which is, of course, the word Roma means black or more. So when this whole system flips, now remember, we're still talking about humanity's slavery, but when the whole system f flips, all we get is a extrapolation or interpolation or polarization or inversion of these colors. So you'll see later on, the white Madonna and child. And this, of course, Madonna is synonymous with Mary, Eve, even Lilith, as far as the, the nighttime character. And then, of course, the child is synonymous with Christ and Tammuz and Damuz and uh, all the rest of the, uh, the saviors and messiahs. Because what you're actually dealing with here is you're dealing with an entire system of knowledge that is built to enslave the individuals that accept the knowledge. And you'll see that over time, even though most people getting involved in this don't admit it and uh, have gotten themselves involved so deep in searching for uh, being special and famous and things of that nature that they have become completely entangled by it. And that's, of course, where this big activation is coming from next year is many people are, are not only have become untangled, but or will also become untangled because the truth is really out and there's nothing that can be done about that. 
Now we see still find here a very um, a very well known image. Um, we have yet to find out if this is truly authentic, but it's uh, it's clearly a uh, a copy, if not a um, an identical description of once again the Madonna or Mary or Venus or Anna. That's another name, Anna, uh, carrying the child, but again in the reptilian uh, caricature or character. And of course, this would match up to Lassell with the elongated skulls here. So I would definitely say that uh, we would need to consider, especially when we go through the Lemurian part of all of this, what kind of bipedaled beings were actually existing here that were also intelligent. Meaning that um, I think that we're playing ourselves when we think that every being that has come across this planet that was intelligent looked like a human in the face. And of course, here, uh, this, this picture's been cut off a little bit, but there's a pentagram that's on the top of the head. This, of course, is pulled from Egypt. And you see also the flute in the hand, which uh, we'll get into the flute symbolism and being able to tame the serpent later on. But again, if that pentagram was there, you would just see the redundification of the, um, the idolism. So what you also find, and this is where we're going to start talking about the other side to this, is that obviously the pentagram is a symbol for flesh and creating things in a physical reality using the spiral force or what we call phi. And that knowledge of creation into the physical reality equals a great level of manifestation, obviously. Also, we'll find that these type of symbols are not exclusive to the occult. They're found in nature. So before we would adapt that the Pentagon is something that Pythagoras cooked up, we would have to first admit that nature it, uh, shows it within um, things such as pyrite. And uh, of course, many of the things that have the phi base uh, geometry are related to the, to the pentagram, but the organic pentagram, which is the one with the curves, and you'll see why that's so important later on. But we'll also see that there's this ongoing volley back and forth between what I call five versus six, because five is a symbol of the flesh and six is actually a symbol of the spirit. Then what we have is when flesh unites with spirit, we get the actual composite of the human being, meaning we're actually mixed with flesh and spirit. So there's definitely something very magnificent going on with why we can maintain in fleshly uh, stance and then also in spiritual stance in real time in both bodies. And that's what's been known as the great work. And so, of course, many men, women, gods, goddesses, kings, queens, etc., have been trying to duplicate that knowledge of being able to, to do the great work to manifest something that is so expansive that it has no limit, that it just continues to spawn. Notice how human, human humanity is continuously spawning, showing that if, if you're talking about energy and production, this is a great thing. While the world is, is bent to think that, oh, if we don't stop expanding, or if we don't stop growing, then this will become our problem. Actually, it's our solution. The immense level of energy that we have, we're able to harness and it continues to grow. So when I get into explaining a lot of the symbolism, I want everyone to, to realize that these symbols are found in nature first. And it's only man, woman, gods, goddesses, demigods, you name it, that keep trying to use it. And oftentimes because of greed, ego, and all of the, the darkness of ignorance, there's a con convolution. We'll just use that word. So let's keep going here. So of course now we're here at six as we just left five, which is obviously Venus. And six, of course, is a, when I say flesh and spirit, some people would also try to say flesh or excuse me, feminine and masculine. And that wouldn't be correct. Six is not a masculine number in the sense that two interlacing triangles or two interlacing fields of energy coming into contact would create energy. So they would have to be opposing poles, positive and negative or male and female. But the reason why six is looked at as a masculine symbol is because six is related to the spirit world and flesh is always seen whether it's a male flesh or a female flesh as feminine why spirits are seen as masculine or like fire 
And so that's something that you really have to understand with a, with the occult is that this way we interpret male and female doesn't apply to how the occult works. What does work though is understanding when your di difference between when you're dealing with flesh, flesh and spirit. So what six has everything to do with is how to bring in two opposing spiritual forces in order to begin to create and generate ethereal energy. That is its root. And ethereal energy's byproduct is pure energy, which of course will, is what we call water and what we need to live. So to show you that this is not something that um, the demigods and the individuals who are writing these books have cooked up, you have to look at the water crystal and you have to see that energy and life in this world is equated, is also equivalent to this particular design. And so this, of course, would be why something or someone would attempt to usurp this symbol and say they are the creators of this symbol or they are the originators of this symbol or this symbol equates to their knowledge. So remember that this is something that is a universal system. The sun shines on everything that will uh, allow itself to be pierced by its rays. But when you get, excuse me, I'm getting a little feedback here. Okay. Well, I'm getting a little feedback, but I'm going to keep going with this. Actually, I hear where that feedback's coming from. That's actually a fan in here. Let me just take a brief moment to stop the recording and start it again since we got a good recording. Okay, we're forward with another recording. Okay, so as you see, as I was explaining, this type of interlacing triangles, which has everything to do with the spirit or ether, has everything to do with your aura and the system around your body that creates energy and keeps you fully conscious on multiple planes, the hyperdimensional vehicle, or what we call at times the torus, which corresponds to the torso or the energy area of our body. Um, that's why Taurus, the constellation, was looked at as where the seven sisters of the Pleiades were, and that was the place where life came from according to their mythos, but their mythos is highly externalized. What it's really talking about is the Taurus shape or the donut-shaped field that is emitted around the body's energy system. So we'll watch as the priestcraft attempts to, or actually succeeds for a while, in systematically um, divesting the natural world and universe of all of its knowledge and claiming that they are the originators of it. This begins with the language of Hebrew, and I actually uh, put this chart or this collage together just for this particular reason and just to show several things at one time. But what you'll see is that Hebrew actually is a, a Megan star, as it's sometimes referred to, or, or Sri Yantra. Uh, drop down upon itself, meaning that if you took all 22 letters and you drop them down, it would equal this same symbol of water. So this is how Hebrew became a language of power and how it was synonymous with now the Kabbalah and the evocation, etc. But to see exactly how long this has been used way before the people who are calling themselves Jews were calling them that, uh, themselves that way before this symbol was used by anyone named Solomon. If you understand the riddle, then of course you can you can interpret it a lot deeper. But realistically, the this particular symbol, which I said is found in nature, was also used throughout time. You even see here on the left an extraterrestrial component. You see here in the modern time it even being used as the recycling system, or which is basic, which is basically regeneration. You see it as the monogram of Christ or what's called the chi, the chi row because it has a lot to do with chi and gold energy or building up energy. Uh, you see it here in a temple as the, as an interlacing uh, spiral which connects to the DNA and how to tap into the DNA. So again, we're talking about a symbol of so much immense power that anyone trying to, to interpret this and take this as their own would be basically uh, capsizing underneath it, meaning that you can't take such powerful symbolism and say, oh, this is something that I created. And it's, it has such an immense level of connection to it because eventually you'll bottleneck under the responsibility. And that's, of course, what's happening to the controllers as we're getting a lot more intelligent about what's really going on here. And we expect more out of our reality. Also notice here within this ancient symbolism on this temple that the pentagram in its upside down position, which is how it's all, which is how it was shown first, especially by the Pythagoreans. It was never pointed straight up. But you see there's a knowledge here of Venus and then also this planet of the hexagram, which we'll find out later is connected to Saturn. So this is, again, knowledge that 
you won't really find all in one place, but if you go and look for it, as you see here, the Louvre or the floor is, um, or the floor here in, uh, in this Catholic cathedral is actually laid out just like the water crystal that I showed you earlier. So what you're finding is a counterfeiter is attempting to usurp all the knowledge through the symbolism. And uh, we're going to another slide here. Now, here's how we break down letters and uh, words over at the resistance. Of course, we're cypherists, meaning that we actually have the code that cracks all words. And uh, we utilize that in order to get us to the truth. It's not something that when someone talks to us, it's not something that we have to believe. We should find a redundification of it everywhere, at least on all corresponding dimensions. So what you'll find here is that the X or actually many of the symbols that are used in the English language are symbols that mean something entirely different than what we're using them for. And of course, that could be extremely disempowering. And that is, of course, a major key to the disempowerment of what's going on in our reality is that we don't really understand what we're saying at times. And so this causes us to, to evoke or invoke things that we don't really want. So understand that the symbol of the X in itself was also the symbol of the axe god. As you see, the word axe and X sound the same. And you also remember there's a faction called the Axis. And of course, this is the single X here. And you'll see the single X equals two V's or two um, triangles. And then you see when those two triangles come together that they make this Megan star again. So you can see that why X means this symbol of energy. Okay. Now, when you take two X's, and this is something you can do right there on a pen and pad in front of you. You take two X's and you draw those two X's in, in um, opposite to each other. And you'll get this symbol, which you see all the time on the, um, on the shields of the royalty. Or you'll get this symbol. So still realize where all of these symbols are coming from when it comes to X and X and all of that are individuals who have taken the knowledge of energy and chose to use it a specific kind of way and then try to teach everyone that that's the only way that it can be used. So just remember this particular chart here because it's going to serve you in the future to understand why you find Mary X must and Christ of course is removed in X because of course Christ and X are the same being. X is then put in and you have now the X mass which I talked about as again mass meaning uh, a ritual of death as in the Catholic mass. So you see Merry Christmas is not so merry, but it is because remember it's Mary with the child. We have Santa Claus and most people know that Santa Claus is related directly and through anagram to Satan, but they also never realize who this character Satan really is and how it connects to uh, the entity known as Nergal, also Marduk. Um, we find an X on the head and an axe in the hand. I couldn't create this myself. We find an eight-pointed star here, uh, which is, of course, the star of Ilu. We find the fleur de lis here. So, again, if, when you understand what they're doing or understand what they're doing, then you can interpret all of this and you start to realize how many of these symbols roll together that the X or the X is actually synonymous after a while with the Sri Yantra or the interlacing of two triangles, which we've proven more than, uh, than enough here. But also another symbol, which is often gone, often goes overlooked, is also connected, which is what we call a swastika. And once again, the swastika is just two opposing forces coming together or two energies that are going in the opposite direction coming together. And we see here that these are ancient uh, um, busts of this type of uh, engraving. So this is not something that was just invented by, you know, the Rosicrucians, you know, during the times of Alexandria. We find here now another symbol which connects the axe in the axis to the swastika. Because what you'll learn later on is that when Hitler claimed uh, to be an Aryan, you will find that he was accepting the, the Druid priesthood, which is, of course, the Druid priesthood of Lamas and uh, Papus or Papus, and they're basically the world priesthood and becoming involved in that. 
And so there wasn't a mis disconnection or, or a misinterpretation of the swastika by Hitler and the faction that he represented. They actually were working for the Green Gloves or the individuals that were in Shambhala at that time and attempting to, to overthrow the world with the priestcraft again. We find here the symbolism being used together, which is, of course, the cross, which you'll see here, and then again, the swastika, you'll see here. And again, the cross is, of course, an X, showing that these symbols are synonymous and have been used since ancient times in conjunction with one another. You'll find in indigenous cultures, of course, the symbol being used. And so that means someone passed the knowledge to them. And this is where we get into the entire story of the migration of the, the knowledge out of the Indus Valley or out of the Lemurian Empire, which is actually encapsulated, as we'll see later on, within the story of Abraham and Saraswati. And of course, Abraham, or excuse me, Abrahman, the Brahmin, and his wife Saraswati left the Indus Valley and went into the world, or left Ur, according to the Bible, Abraham and Sarah, of course, are the same character, left Ur or Chaldea and because of uh, wanting to start a new priesthood, wanting to bring in a quote-unquote a new God. So you can see that there's a repackaging of this message that has happened when there's an entry of or an exit of a group of individuals leaving the Indus Valley you know, with the Lemurian knowledge Many of them Brahmins, also later on called Elohim, and then beginning to distribute this knowledge into the indigenous um, population, mainly under uh, the yoke of uh, worship. And of course, they went to these areas enslaving these people. Here we see Axe, the Axe uh, born by Zeus to show you the connection. And of course, Zeus is Deus, and Deus is Jesus, etc. All of the same being. Of course, we see here a modern ron rendition of uh, Brahma. Of course, uh, with the white beard, which I call the Saturnalia motif. Of course, Saturnalia motif is always the white beard like Santa Claus or the, the gentleman on uh, Harry Potter and also uh, on Lord of the Rings. And you get this long white beard and, and then you start to see where it all connects because they always use the same symbolism. You see here the swastika being shown in the Aryan Empire with the fleur de lis to show you that the, the queen's uh, of the Queen of uh, Britain is utilizing Aryan symbolism and symbolism from ancient empires from Lemuria. And this, of course, is after the usurping uh, during the time and the entry of the Atlantean Empire. So we see here Cain, the wanderer. And of course, Cain is, uh, is a word that easily anagram and, and cross through other languages actually means Cain. It's Cain and Khan are synonymous. Uh, Khan and priest. Cohen, um, all of these words, King and Cain, of course, are synonymous. Smith is synonymous. So what we find is an archetype of an individual, and as you see here in the belt and hammer, of a wanderer that has to leave the garden. And later on, you'll learn that that garden was Persia. The beautiful gardens of Persia definitely cannot be denied. And sent into the land with the symbols, which is, of course, the, the, um, the swastikas, and uh, the eight-pointed stars, and all the symbols that they could conquer with. And because that's why I said, in these signs ye shall conquer. So let's keep going here. We see, of course, now the Aryan symbolism underneath um, the empire of Hitler with the eagle, which is really the most replete symbolism in itself and by itself, wherever you see the eagle uh, being used, which you'll find also, of course, in Buddhism, especially for the meditation symbols, then you understand that you're still dealing with what's called the double-headed eagle or basically the dualistic God principle. We find in here Cain, surrounded by an hexagon, smithing, meaning Tubal Cain taught them how to shape and fashion swords. So generally, when Santa Claus came to people's land, it was with weapons. And at times, they left those weapons to the indigenous people to finish each other off. And so king, con, king, coin, coin, all was synonymous with basically warlike beings. They brought war to the planet, taught how to war with one another, and then how to do that based on how much we favor them 
meaning that humanity has basically been serving out a prism sentence because they are worshiping or on a warship, utilizing their energy to attack others. Many of those people are beings they don't even understand or know about. So we find here an ancient symbolism of Ramen, which of course is the ram synonymous with Mars, the red or red shield. Ramen with his axe, once again with the, the sticks shaped like the hexagram. And you find him being toted about by his cherub or four wind energies or four energies. And so you find this symbolism starting all over the world. And of course, the major thing not to miss here is the horns because this gets us to understand why they always use this horn symbolism and why Venus is holding that horn in her hand and was said to birth the first king or Khan onto this planet. Sounds like King Kong. This of course is Hearn, excuse me, Hearn the Hunter, which comes from the, um, the Norse lore. This is the same individual, excuse me, um, synonymous with Santa Claus, but you see the, the horns here and then you see, of course, the Santa Claus motif and then the evergreen um, or the, the leaves of fall, the fallen. We find Puck or Pooh or Pan, which is, of course, the key to the whole papacy and the circle of Cirque. Um, you find the Druids or the Druze dancing around and evoking Pan, who also has the horns and, of course, another horn here. We find Moses in the same motif with the beard and the horns. We find Jupiter, Amon, which is where they get the word Amen from here with the horns, because this was the religion that was taken from Egypt, which was a, a, slave, a, a slave religion a, of slave gods. Uh, something that you would learn in prison or prism. And that's why even in modern times, when a person goes to prison, they throw them the Bible and they ask them to call upon Agatha demon to defeat the demons that they've already incurred in the physical reality. Big thing about this today is people get real now. Like you get adult, you get adept, you know exactly what's going on and you start to shape yourself up, you patch up a lot of your holes, especially in your aura, and then you start to build energy from there, and it's magnificent. Okay, what you'll find here again is um, Odin. You see the dogs. Now, this is why you have to keep locking onto the symbolism, because as it changed, these wolves, excuse me, are actually Sirius, also known as Big Five or the Dog Star, which is under the symbol of the pentagram because it's under the control of the pentagram. And of course, that means that people are worshiping something to do with Sirius or worshiping the dogs or the canine and also worshiping uh, um, the Ka in a sense that the Ka or the vehicle or the covenant that contain the actual covenant with the canine. So the canine is a very... Um, deep symbolism because it's actually a cannonball also or can, a cannonball also canaan ball is the term and what this really means is a person who will eat flesh it doesn't just mean a person who will eat another person and this is why you know i was trying to tell people earlier especially in the year that yo you really want to get away from the meat because there's a karmic hold to it car is as in carnivore as in carne that when you eat the meat or you eat flesh and you eat blood or you do the Eucharist, eat of my flesh, drink of my blood, then you actually incur the, the actual um, binding to the God. So remember this, how it was looked at by the, ancient, in the, by the ancients is that all the animals that existed here at the time were part of us or our brothers and sisters in some way. So to eat them would be in effect like eating yourself. So Remember, this is a very important thing, especially as you go into 2013, to make sure you don't get caught up with these guys. This is uh, the symbol that's on the gate of Buckingham Palace. This is shot from underneath so that you can see that they worship Baal, who's also synonymous with Lord, the Lord God. And the symbolism, again, is replete. You see here, this is basically a Sri Yantra. You see the fleur de lis. But you also see under this what is a huge crown, which most people don't see, Baal with his horns here. So it lets you know that, and of course, this 
unicorn I found out is not actually a unicorn. It's a it's a um, an encrypted symbol of the horn god also, and because there was never any unicorns, but what there were is entities that had just one horn, which were um, synonymous with the cyclopean beings. We find again Alexander the Great later on be called, uh, becoming called the Great Two Horn. You find here Osiris with Apis on his back. And the reason why this motif is done like this for people who think Osiris is something else beside what he's not, Osiris is connected to Sirius and of course connected to Orion, even by the way the pyramids are, are positioned. But you find Apis on the back because he is the horn god. We find here modern Saturnalian Romani, Ro, uh, Roman motif, which of course is where the Saturnalia comes from. The axe is then replaced with a scythe because this is after it took a, a, a Cuthan transformation. This is, of course, the Cuthians, which were the individuals coming out of Samaria, the Cuthites, or also called Scytheans. And all those words to cut and to scythe mean to cut someone off. And of course, as you can see with the axe symbolism, everything about them is creating the sword and creating war. So that's how you can sum it up really fast, is that once you leave duality and stop warring with other individuals that are just caught up in this and start to really see what's going on, you expand because that's what you haven't been doing. Of course, we see these rays coming out of the head, but these rays are really horns. We find here, again, another complete uh, explanation of the Saturnalian Brotherhood. You find the merging now of the symbol of the Sri Yantra and the, um, the swastika, which is also seen in the symbol of the Raelian movement. But this is proof, again, that these symbols are synonymous with one another, and these symbols belong to people who are counterfeiting the creation and have been doing so for a long time because they have taken the knowledge of the original priestcraft which is uh, basically astro astronomy and astrology and have brought it into the external world for all of what it's capable of doing and began to triumph or appear to triumph over individuals uh, because of what they keep inventing and showing uh, people that they have control of and over. We find the symbol here again, the connecting of the swastika along with the connecting of the Sri Yantra as being a very modern but very occult and revealing symbol of the new, uh, actually it's not new, but the mer emerging of this brotherhood. We find here Ophiuchus, which is the 13th sign. We'll get into how the number 13 connects to Venus in just a moment, but we'll find the 13th sign of Ophiuchus was all of a sudden entered this year. If everyone remembers, I think, was it this year or late last year? But what they all of a sudden, after having all this astrological knowledge for centuries with the Greeks and the Egyptians and everyone else, all of a sudden they can't figure out that there's 13 constellations and then decide to announce it. And so you got to watch the symbolism. What they're saying is, is that they want to reveal the one who's bearing the serpent. This again is Kukulkan. This again is even Orion, creating another constellation that looks like Orion, the bearded white man, as you see, returning, which is, of course, the 13th uh, sign of the zodiac is supposed to be the end of the, the Mayan calendar. We find here Orion also in that same motif as a giant. Now, Again, as I was explaining earlier, that the mess up in the numbers is, is September, October, November, December. Of course, Sept means seven, Oct means eight, Nov means nine, and Dec means ten. The ten is synonymous with the Alpha and the Omega, or I-A-O, which is the symbol that they went under the Agatha demon. Again, is uh, Abraxas, 365 days, as you see, Abrax. There's an X inside of that word. This, again, is none other than the Messiah, uh, mythos, which has infected the world. So what you find here is to break down the numbers really briefly about why they chose these particular dates, because obviously they don't line up with the procession of Venus for anyone that understands, you know, the procession of Venus and will it will, when it will make its, its next cycle. What you'll find here is that it's not at 1111 and it's not on the 21st. And so it leads us to asking, well, why are they using that, those particular numbers? And of course, what we find here is another code. And we love to crack code. So here we are with 12, which is 3, 21, which is 3, 
the 20 which should not be counted because it, it is the year meaning that this is something that goes on every year so to count the year is frivolous so you need to count the day so you get a 12 again which is three and then you get the time 11 11 the digital time code which means a door or dalith or a scythe or opening up a door which is uh how the actual dalith symbol is shaped it's also shaped like a a, a scythe within itself and um, so what it's used to do is to cleave open the womb or the door of the reality. So you'll find that this number 13 is related to something secret because, of course, before the door opens and you don't know what's on the other side. Another thing is if you take the actual geometric correspondence to numbers, you'll be able to put stuff together. And of course, you see three and four, a triangle and a square. A triangle on top of a square is the universal symbol for a house. Remember, you drew that as a kid. And then three plus four equals seven, which means when the house or the prism prison is built, you see if you add another triangle here, it makes a complete prism. When the prism is built, there are seven colors then or seven rays of division that emit from it. Okay, as we see here, the symbol of the Dalith, which is, um, of course, in Kabbalah, which means the door or the pathway or to enter. And this symbol was, even in the late times, the exact same symbol. This is also, of course, the number seven. Um, and this was used, if you held the handle here, it was like a cleaver. It could be used to chop open or bust open something. And the reason why this symbolism was used uh, is because when it was said that when the child came out of the womb, that it had to ram the walls of the mother's womb in order to, which is shaped like a fallopian tube, is also shaped like a, a ram, but it would have to ram the wall in order to knock the wall down, which is, of course, the cervix or the cervix if you understand the, the etymology behind that, and then go through that to come into the physical world. So it was always seen that if you had one of these tools, then it was easier for you to get through things. Of course, the numerical number again is four, which is synonymous with door or gate. Here's another way to begin to take apart the symbolism by using numbers like uh, you find here one, which is a, obviously a straight line and three, which is a triangle, and then putting those together. And then you create what is this symbol, which is basically when you remove the edges here and you look at just what's in the center here is the eye and the pyramid, which actually this 13 means hidden. So this is why there's no 13th floor in most buildings. There's no 13th owl on most airplanes. Uh, you have the whole symbolism with Jesus or Nehushtan, who, who's the brazen serpent himself, with 12 disciples. Uh, so Jesus and 12 disciples equal 13. We find 12 signs of the zodiac again, but then adding that one hidden sign, Ophiuchus, which is 13. So you can see it has a lot to do with the secret, secret uh, synchronicities with Venus and how that, that procession of uh, the number 13 comes into play. And just to be very clear about the procession of Venus as far as the numbers, um, you'll find that the numbers 5, 8, and 13 ring out with Venus, and then Venus orbits the sun 13 times in eight years. Uh, Venus traces out a pentagram, which has five points, of course, in the night sky, and then every procession of eight years uh, so that's 8 plus 5, which actually equals 13. And then it takes 584 days for Venus to go around and catch up with the Earth because we're also on orbit. And then 584 times 5 gives us 2,920. And then 2,920 divided by 5 gives us 365 days in our year. So you can see Venus is uh, used as a cipher, and that's why it was also known as Lucifer. Uh, to encode the light or to actually decode, excuse me, the light as five can decode the six. This is getting good. Okay, so now what we find is the connection of the Lemurian Empire obviously was a major connection with the constellation of Orion as that information already proved that the, um, that the Lemurian Empire was majorly... Um, major it was excuse me I'm talking for a while now but the Lemurian Empire was seated within the anchor with the area we know as anchor water Cambodia this of course is the home of the the darkest uh, level of magic known as Sankyat so what happens is is that this of course is where the whole Tomb Raider mythos comes from also and you see that Angelina Jolie got the Sankyat tattoo on her back but this entire constellation of Orion and the Nephilim coming to earth by way of Venus because of course they have to and, and uh, they have to incarnate into physical bodies which is what Venus does and then 
you find this priestcraft set up here on earth where people are instructed, obviously the indigenous people are instructed to build these monuments and temples and begin to populate rapidly. And then there grows out of all of this a very deeply um, disturbed slave nation, which actually is the state that many are existing in right now, which is the damage of what has happened in the past with our interaction with the beings from Orion. So what you have here, obviously, is, again, the building of the Orion temples. And then out front, there's barely, they're still recognizable, but you'll see the Naga. Now, it's important to understand the Lemurian symbolism because all the symbolism later on can't even be understood unless you decode the Lemurian symbolism because the Lemurians just went underground and then reemerged under different symbolism and used someone else as their front man or woman or dog or whatever you whatever kind of entity they were using but originally it was under the serpent and the serpent it was seven serpents synonymous with the seven planets uh, excuse me the seven spiritual vehicles excuse me uh, in the chakras you have to understand that there's not just seven planets obviously in space but there are seven planets that are primarily or seven celestial bodies that are primarily known and this of course gives us the and used within the occult and this gives us the seven days of the week but we obviously see that monday this is why I say that the seven chakras don't correspond to seven planets. They correspond to seven celestial bodies because Monday is a moon. And so you'll see that you can probably find the connection between many of these entities within the connection of, um, of the planetary systems as far as the ones that they're idolizing. Mars, Venus, Mercury, Uranus, Saturn, Neptune. These planets are pretty much run replete within this symbolism, but are not all of the planets in the solar system. So you can see, obviously, that they're choosing to, to partialize the world with just this specific part of the story. And uh, here we have, again, a temple of Angkor Wat, uh, or temple in, uh, in Cambodia being lined up to Angkor Wat. Now, here's obviously what was going on with the Lemurian Empire. As I said before, it's been about war since the beginning. Some of the tools that were used for the war were encrypted under symbols of a bow, and an arrow here you actually do get a glimpse as i said it doesn't appear that many of the entities that were living here during that time looked completely like how we look now um, they tend to carry some type of animalistic or or even uh, ham or pork like face uh, or, or boar type face and human bodies so what you have here is you have them utilizing a weapon obviously what we would call today a weapon of mass destruction. And this is what I believe eventually led to the first sinking of the Indus Valley. Because when you look deeper into the Angkor Wat story, you'll find that the reason why the actual uh, place became desolate was the water and irrigation system became completely dysfunctional and all the water began to, to basically become mismanaged and got uh, uh, infected. And then people began to catch and break out in diseases. And it was just a mess in Angkor Wat. But you just have to check out a lot of the Discovery Channel stuff on it with Sri Avarman and all the energies that were being evoked. We find here again another one waff or wonder weapon being used by the Aryan. You see the actual Psy, which is now comes to us as the fleur de lis, being used also. This is the Psy as in Scion. This is the Shin symbol. The Shin is also synonymous with the moon. You see here even an M, but we won't read into that too deeply. But we find here again that the Naga were engaged in a battle with each other and with Asuras and with Aryans. And it wasn't a good side if people are looking to her, well, I need to jump on one side and, and fight with them. They just were locked in an ever uh, a conflict, uh, ever going conflict until one of them decided to get out of it. So it sounds like the same kind of story that we're having today. So you'll be locked into this conflict with this world and you until you decide to, to get out of it. And that's just how it works. So as we go on, again, the major wars of the Lemurian empires, I really uh, got this here just to show you that the Nagas had as their leader Ananta. He was the first of all the Nagas. So if you look at this name An, you'll find in the Sanskrit language, An is repeated several times, Anananda. I, you'll find it, you just look into the Sanskrit language and then you'll find the connection between the An and the Nagas and the Anunnaki because all the words are synonymous with the same group of beings. You'll find also the same thing going on, modern day worship. 
meaning that when you go into these countries where they still have pyramid systems, they still see it necessary and uh, divine to worship and to believe in what the pyramid stood for, but they never ask at any point, uh, what does it really stand for? Or maybe, what, how should I put it? Uh, basically, they never get the knowledge and they don't pursue the knowledge enough to understand the difference between what they've been told versus the truth. So just remember, all these kind of cyclopean structures are the signs of civilization. When, when uh, humanity used to live as hunter and gatherer, etc., they used to roam around and really do what they want and bask in the glow of the garden because really the earth was completely fertile. There was flowers and plants and fruit and all sorts of things here. So when this pyramidal system starts to come into play, this is actually the arrivals itself. So if you want to know when was the alien invasion, it already took place. As we see also for those that love to argue about the actual meaning of the word Lucifer and, you know, want to make Lucifer the good guy. I've noticed this going on these days that people try to interpret Lucifer in various ways. But again, in Tibet, this comes from, of course, a very old book you can still see based on the spelling. But in Tibet, the springs, rivers and lakes are still ruled by the Naga, demigods or Lu. This is a time where you get the word Lu, which is synonymous with Li which is synonymous with um, Lee, of course, is a popular uh, Asian last name. Lee, Lu, La, Lo, basically L with every vowel behind it equals the Naga because the Nagas are the Ls, sometimes called Elves. So let's keep going here. We find Ifrit basking in the garden, serpent on the tree here, and then you'll see that this is obviously an old depiction of some of the same in in entities, also known as the Asuras, hanging out, basking around, getting taken care of. And of course, to the standard size human, there was, um, there was a great fear of, of many of these entities. And that's why there was a war at a certain point, because uh, as these entities began to mate with the indigenous, there came out children that were uh, divinely uh, <laughs> blessed, I would say, or, or, or the gift and the curse, sometimes you can look at it, with these same gifts of these gods, especially with fire and being able to bring up Kundalini or serpent energy. And so there, this whole empire of Lemuria rolls into a massive conflict with their children, which was actually the Atlanteans. And so for the record, if those that want to know the melanin and the melanin dominant, the melanin recessive connection is that the father and or the father and mother and their children. So what you'll find here is after the you see here again, this is the Naga um, of the Lemurian Empire. You find the conch shell, which is a symbol of phi. If you notice when you, open, you look into a conch shell, you see the spiral. You see it being offered as wisdom. This is how the serpent became synonymous with wisdom. You find here five instead of seven Naga, which is key because this particular entity actually stands for Venus. So we find that connection. You see the body is terminated as a, in a serpent shape. Again, we find more Naga here. We find uh, Fuxi, which is in the Japanese and Chinese empires. Let me reset this thing here. But you'll find that they, um, that they also stylized their first kings and queens, of course, as being serpents or at least terminated in serpent. More Naga. Obviously they were, you know, they were stylizing the Naga everywhere. It was a symbol of worship. Um, wherever it was put, it meant that the priesthood was there. Of course, you see the serpent is also on the uh, forehead of the, in the Egyptian priesthood. Um, and when you came to these places, it generally meant that you were going to be inducted into the priesthood. And all of these Eve angels, which were these go-betweens between God or the Most High and, and you, were intercessors or sometimes seen as messiahs, etc. But really, they were filters to the truth. And of course, so much more expansion existed beyond this. And you see there's alm signs here. Because as I've been reading the secret to this alm sign, which I'll just reserve for when I finally finish reading that entire script, but it is related to Ophelatria. And actually, I believe it's also related to opening up the gate in itself. So a person also determines what comes across the gate by how they, uh, how they are. 
You also find here, obviously, an encounter. This is a, a more modern painting, but an encounter between the Native American and the reptilian. Um, this picture I, I was seeing earlier was kind of out of place, but and it was duplicated. But again, here's the one I was looking for. This is Brahma. Now, the interesting thing is, is that this Brahmic tradition, which is obviously the Lemurian tradition, as I said earlier, is moved then to the what we call the, the Western world. And one of the Brahmas, and this is what we need to really see, is that one of the Brahmas started migrating heavily into the areas that we're calling Native America. Now, the Brahmas went in different places, excuse me, Northern America. But you'll see here that the symbolism of the Brahmins always is the swastika, the eight-pointed star, the arrow, the serpent, and the bell with the horns, because remember, bell is ball. And this is, and of course, this tool is used as an evocation or to ring the frequency of ball as they did at the, the Olympics. So we find here in the mystical books, it says that this is the symbols and the sign that you, or what you see when you encounter a demon. Now, this is actually stylized exactly after Solomon, who, of course, is Cassiel, who's the angel of Saturn, which, of course, we see the connection and we see the beard. We see the crown of kingship because this is also synonymous with Cain or Khan. And then we, of course, see the, the broken pentagram. Now we're entering into the Atlantean Empire or the ones who love to keep themselves separate. They, of course, live uh, in many cases in the island areas they lived. And um, this was so that they could, it was for ease of access to many of the areas that they were in most cases terrorizing. And they would leave from these areas and they would go into different countries and they would bring their priesthood and their priestcraft. And they would also be on warships and cherubims and different vehicles that people would be astonished in seeing. And so it'd be just like today if someone rolled up on to you in a Bugatti or a Lamborghini and said, hey, you know, jump in. You got to ask yourself, would you really jump in? So that's what was going on with the indigenous people. They were fascinated with what these uh, Atlanteans had collected over time in pillaging different empires. We find also the king of Tyree, because here's where you get the whole idea of, cro of individuals crossing the sea in order to get to these particular areas. And this is why they were often depicted as having wings or coming from the sky. But in reality, most of them crossed over in boats. Now, this is the king of Tyree, which, of course, is mentioned in the Old Testament of the Bible. You see him on the Leviathan or the beast, the sea beast, and you see the bow in the hand once more. As I said, that symbolism is replete, and there appears to be an Ouroboros around this coin and a dolphin here. So this, is, of course, is also Dionysus, is synonymous with the king of Tyree. Um, you find here how, and this is not the greatest picture, but um, you find here Brahma and Saraswati. And as I said earlier in the conversation, Brahma is translated into the, the English Bible as Abraham or Abram. He becomes Abraham when he becomes the, uh, the father of the tribe of Ham, by the way. And um, so his wife, Sarah, Abraham and his wife, Sarah, are Abraham and Saraswati. So it lets you know that this Lemurian tradition and Hindu tradition, etc., crossed into the Bible a long time ago. So it allows you to see very clearly that obviously if Brahma and Saraswati are here, then Krishna or Christ would also have to be here meaning that Krishna or Christ would also have to be within this priestcraft or tradition because the child always has to be around somewhere. And so, of course, we find that people are worshiping Christ, uh, thinking that that's a new thing and that they have this, that they're being told that they have the, they're the chosen ones and they have the, the only real Christ. But it's all a hoax because the real Christ was, of course, Krishna and Krishna was black. And also the thing is about the reason why Krishna is, is of course, obviously the child that Mary is holding is the black Madonna. When stylized, the most that they could, into the, the modern text, the most that they can do to try to hide it was make Krishna blue, which, of course, is how you see the pictures of Krishna now where Krishna is blue um, because the people had just too many books depicting Krishna as this color, of course, coming from Venus. So we find, again, another Krishna replete with the Sri Yantra or with the Megan star uh, everywhere. So you see, this is also a symbol of the priesthood. So wh whoever's looking for a savior, because some people are like, and this symbol also right here is called Leviathan, by the way. It's 
where they get that the Norwal or the horned sea beast. But you have to look deep into symbolism before you can recognize what this is. And of course, the peacock has always been synonymous with the Phoenicians and also the Phoenix, which of course brought the phonetics or the language. So of course, we see here again the Sri Yantras. We also see the flute, which was held in the other hand of the individual with the five-pointed star on their head, meaning knowing how to charm serpents. And this means that in, the, in a tense, because there is, as you see, there's a reptilian portion of the brain. There's, of course, a spine in a person's body, and there's these fluids. The idea of being able to charm or move up these fluids with tones and vibrations is really what this flute symbolism entails. And that's why Pythagoras was uh, fascinated when, when he was said to finally discover the, the notes and the scales to the harmonics. And of course, this is a gentleman reading the Kibra Nagast to show you that the Ethiop or the Ethiopes were, were actually worshipers of the serpent uh, in Ophelatreia. And even that's what the word Ethiop actually means. So anytime you look into the deeper symbolism, you'll find that the Nagas definitely passed through Nubia and that they set up an entire priest class there. And that's why the Ethiopians claim that they are the founders of the original covenant. And the guy, uh, the Weakin, uh, obviously is in the know to a certain degree, even though he doesn't want to tell his people, but he shows the horn god Menelik or ML, MLK or Moloch, the king or the crown horn god and why he's singing, I know everything. So what it's about is about, once again, the horn god. I mean, sick. This is, you know, coming to an end at the end of this year, obviously. We see here Krishna, again, with the flute. And this is the general stylization of Krishna. And as Krishna starts to metamorphosize, and actually the religions begin to metamorphosize, no longer is uh, the God depicted as a serpent. The God becomes depicted as a man. And the reason why this was done is to invent the ego or the eagle or the idea that we're actually, how can I put it? It can invent the idea that we're, we've actually obtained the state of the most high while still being in our lowest state. And so this is why there was a decision, obviously, by the priest, priestcraft to take away the serpent symbolism. And more than likely, there were several conflicts of, of, uh, with other individuals in getting rid of this symbolism. And so what they decided is to then begin to stylize the god as a man. And if people want to understand, well, is it, if people want to think, well, that was the best thing, then that's how, you know, we, uh, we, we really can expand even further. You have to think about the symbolism of Christianity, which is man crucified or because that's what it came into now. So earlier when it's as Krishna, it's as this symbolism. And this is a rare picture of when it's completely metamorphosized because generally Krishna is shown with serpents and everything around him. And that's what we'll see in these later pictures. But this is as it begins to take its metamorphosis. So this is what you have to watch because now you'll find here Krishna laying on the boat like Dionysus with the Naga, meaning with the actual... Uh, um, the energies or the Nephilim or, you know, the, the, the chakra center energy, as we talked about that connection, as you see, this is a huge serpent with him laying on it and using it for support. And this is, becomes important to actually read the symbolism. Then you see there's always a Saraswati like entity around as the mother is also um, um, as a mother in this type of in this type of symbolism, the mother equals this is not only her child but also her husband and this comes from the knowledge that all men still come out of a woman's womb and this is why man masculine male machismo and all of those words begin with ma which actually means a woman according to how our language is put together and this of course is also why just to to, to uh, add this information why in the bible god is known as being a he or a he because in hebrew he is a pentagram but means a female not a male so this is how the venusian initiation is taking place in the old testament with shekinah or the wife of the sheik or the wife of the sheika or uh, excuse me the sheikah the wife of the sheik and uh the individuals that are pr practicing in the cult of al jabbar who's orion also we find here hermes and instead of him on the naga 
or excuse me, Horus, and instead of him on the Naga, he's actually on the crocodile. Now, generally, these type of individuals were not so much as savior gods how we see them today, but individuals that bought key things to certain countries that basically changed how they function. So in the case with Horus, it, in many ways, it was horses. And if you especially understand who the kingdom of um, Horus really was and, and how they uh, trek the land with horses and how they bought those horses to people and they were completely amazed because they were domesticated, etc. And all the way up until the ancient tradition of the priestcraft in which these individuals are following because they're coming in colonizing. That's why they have horses and all these different things that are not seen in places that they enter into. Again, we find Buddha with the swastika and a lot of people are going to be a little upset because they really like Buddhism. But at, at the same time, if a person has a lot more opportunity to focus on themselves rather than the teachings and the knowledge of others for prolonged periods of time, meaning that if you look into the Buddhistic text, it basically repeats the same thing over and over again. So either you move to another level of knowledge or you graduate or, and you graduate that course or you become stuck as, a, as what they call a Buddhist. And so, which they say, you can spend thousands of lifetimes before getting an awakening. An awakening has a lot to do with your pH balance, has a lot to do with how much energy you have, your spiritual tie and connection, and whether that connection is either connected or severed, and et cetera. If something's draining your energy or giving you energy and, and that's not plugged in. So there's a lot more details to it that are very specific. So it has more to do with that than you know, what the priest crafts have been trying to teach. Of course, we see Marduk doing the same thing, riding on a boat or a behemoth or a leviathan or a cherub and going over to another part of the area in order to colonize. Dionysus doing the same thing. As you see, things get really redundant here. Of course, that's why we're more towards the end of the, today's message. We see here those uh, melanin recessive entering into the indigenous lands and beginning to trade and show them things that they've never seen, telescopes and things of this nature. Even today, like people think, well, no, this is not what's happening. This isn't happening. Even today, you can still go into places here in Costa Rica where the people there do not really have much contact with the outside world. Likewise, if you go into the Amazon, you'll find a lot of them also. And in some of the pre-Columbian areas, especially in, uh, excuse me, in the Colombia, you'll find them also. So when people come with more things you see he's got the sword out and the people never seen that before then there is a basically immense fascination and then an idolization and then if they, they're commanded to worship they begin to worship and this is why uh, the Lord saw that man was the most valuable man and woman were the most valuable commodities because man and woman would bring the cows they would bring the oxen and they would even bring their own children if they were demanded to just to gain favor with these uh these lords who said that they represented the real god because they could uh display things like electricity and they could display a show of of one who has kundalini but of course in the background of the priesthood you have individuals such as the dagon character which of course is dagon uh, it has everything to do with just another packaged up version of the Sumerian Brotherhood controlling everything as you see the Pope with the fish hat and all this stuff people pretty much know. But you really have to see that this is a real thing and it connects all around the world because there's another level to it. Of course, here you find a Dogen with the actual uh, Orion giant mask on because this really connects back to Orion, not just Venus. But you see here, this mass is actually synonymous with uh, what the, the size and the stature of the entities that came by way of Venus to this planet. So that's really what the Dogon are actually involved in for those who are still confused. And I've actually uh, have some other pictures to show that much of the headdresses and things that they wear and the particular Adinkra language that they're using connects to the evocations of Saturn, Sirius and this entire priestcraft that's always been going on that according to the latest interview with the, the individuals that they bought from the Dogen tribe that they don't have any problems with. In fact, they spoke very conceited and haughty as if that humanity was just basically subservient to the gods and that when the gods decided whether we were going to be here or not, then that's what would take place. And again, that type of idea doesn't allow you even to pass or transcend from this dimension with the graduation or university or the universal certificate, meaning that if you still feel like that something is is over you and controlling you and you have to serve it, you go nowhere but the prism. OK, so as we continue, we find here Jesus, of course, and this is obviously Dagon. Dagon is now John. John, of course, is Oannes. Oannes is the god of the sea. 
and uh, that's of course Neptune, Dionysus, etc. And then you see the concept of using a fish to catch other fish. This is something that the priestcraft knows that in order to catch people up into their their uh, foolish religions, they must use their own the own kind of people. They can't go in there as you know uh, the entities that they are. And this is why you you seldom see that God quote unquote appears to man or can be seen by man. Instead, you get these Eve angels because it's highly possible, first of all, that their God is astral, uh, is uh, hyperdimensional, but in many senses cannot appear in a physical reality, but still has servants in the physical reality. And as we see here, a serpent coming from the sky, whispering into the ear of Jesus, and this is supposed to be the temptation, but in actuality is a game and a hoax of them playing the good and evil dualistic perspective with the same character, as everyone knows that Jesus in the occult, that Jesus is actually Agatha demon, meaning that Jesus or the character of Jesus is the strongest demon. So keep going here. Here's the replete, the papacy and what it really looks like on a hyperdimensional level. As I said, this is an adept conversation. You'll find Cain, who's the Khan, who's the king, who's the coin, who's the Cohen, who's the priest with his crucified man uh, uh, religion, which is basically not man off the cross, but man on the cross. Using the cross because it's a symbol of spokes or the wheels or the gates of the dimension and actually tangled up in it. This means that a person doesn't have control over their chakra centers and the chakra sister centers don't even work. Of course, you see the beasts back here, the dog. You see the, uh, the character known as the devil. But you also see the ta and the T, which is the cross. And you see the cherub, one here, one here, the tetra, as it's called. Uh, hauling God who's, uh, who's really Yod or the Gothic God who is no more than a man being worshipped as the Most High. We find here again the priesthood of Dagon uh, weeding its way into everywhere carrying out the same rites that were carried on in Egypt. We see Apollo and the Gamadion which is the original Tetragrammaton the four horses or the four horsemen that are actually pulling him as the chariot. And these are, of course, the wheels of Ezekiel. It could be as simple as an actual physical chariot rather than a spaceship that they're making it now. And of course, this is the Greek, again, the Greek Apollo with the symbol of the priesthood on his chest, which you now see it as. Here's even a modern coin or not so modern, but modern enough, 1792 from Barbados. You find the actual Hexagram here, as we've seen in the pictures earlier, the trident, which is the fleur de lis, the king riding on this cherub and riding off to go and conquer something and slay something with the fork, which is also seen in the hand of the devil, of course. Here's the account of what the Mayans recorded of the arrivals of uh, what we call today the Nephilim. Um, this is actually entire, supposed to be an entire scene of the Nephilim and the animal-like natures of them is encased on their heads uh, or in their headdresses. Um, you see here there's again a worship, uh, excuse me, an in introduction and then a worshiping ceremony taking place here. And then you can just tell by the whole demeanor that there is something somewhat of a negative connotation going on. But of course, you don't have to take my word for that. When you get into understanding it, you'll find out that what they record is that when these entities arrived and then left, what they left was an elongated skull crystallized. And that was kept uh, to interact with them and to communicate with them. And that, of course, gives us the whole mythos of the crystal skull. And that's, of course, why they rolled it into the Indiana Jones, because, of course, in the Indiana Jones, they pursued the Ark of the Covenant. They pursued the Ark of the Covenant in Tibet, not in Egypt. They went to Egypt the second time. So it shows you the connection also between the Nazis. So everything is, is all there. This is a real story. This is something taking place. It now resides in most people's subconscious mind as just a movie or something that is fictitious, but it is, in fact, actuality. Um, again, we're really close to the end of this reel, so I'm just going to finish this off. As you see, it's still going on, and this is what, uh, what I really wanted to tell my brothers and sisters, that, um, man, humanity, we're such beautiful people. And what happens is, is that if we fail to realize what we're doing, of course, this is the arrow or the bow, and then this is, of course, the horn, then we can get caught up into believing that this is our tradition and this is what, we, this is what really defines us. And when in all actuality, it's what, is, what has been taught to us as our tradition and what defines us. So we need to be very clear about the difference between the two.
Okay, what we find here, again, is one of the final busts, which is the arrivals. And uh, I just kind of wanted to close out this part of the segment with that, just letting people know that um, this is some stuff that you can look into, you can investigate for yourself. I do also have one more clip that I would like to end things with here. And uh, this clip is really for those who just deny it. And they're like, you know what, I, I just, you know, I can't believe that this is going on. I don't see how someone could carry out such an agenda to this degree without anyone knowing. And um, so I just, you know, I don't believe what you're saying. And then so what I have to tell that person is, is that what you're missing is you're missing the priestcraft, meaning you're actually missing the immense amount of individuals that have come through our time and metamorphosized where we, what we've been doing and how we've been living and what we believe to be true. And then when you study deep into the, uh, ma the major faction, and of course they all carry the same symbols, then you start seeing that their actual agenda for humanity is very dark and has everything to do with death and decay and destruction and, and skulls and all of that stuff. And so what it tells us is, is that there is always an extreme hunger by men and women to gain the power uh, and the recognition that comes with being adept. But what often happens is, is that there's not an, a, a full realization that truly being adept is being a dog. That means to take care of your responsibilities, to actually use your powers and your abilities to your best, uh, to your best potential and to not utilize it to enslave others. And so what we found in the past is we found these individuals have gotten together and they began to rally together with one common cause, which is to elate themselves over everyone else. And what this has only given us is a world that is lacking invention and lacking imagination. And now we're, we're stagnant, again, using the oil and using up fossil fuels, things of old times, and not moving into the expansion of the magnetics and all the information that's been delivered to us about total expansion. And so what I highly encourage people today is to look deeply into their lives and into what they're doing in this world and to ask themselves if somehow they've affiliated themselves with uh, these energies and these forces and didn't know it. And also ask them to think about transmuting, because of course I can't force anyone to do anything, everything's your choice, but think about transmuting what you've done and what has become your foundation or your past or what they call the darkness, or as I said, the soil, to transmute that into allowing you to become the full-blown tree that you need to be. Like, remember, everyone here is a star seed, but not every seed becomes a tree. So what we find is that if, a tr if the seed falls on whatever environment or soil that the tree gets on is going to determine, or the seed gets on is going to determine what it becomes. And so I highly want to, again, encourage everyone to take a look at 2012, see it as the major level of expansion because all this information has come to you packaged nicely enough for you to get the picture, <laughs> thousands of pictures of, of kind of what's going on, for you to come to the, um, the conclusion within yourself of what you need to do, meaning the cleansing that has to take place, the, mind, the cleansing of the mind, body, and soul. I would take this time to, to talk about solutions as these reels run of the, the issue. <laughs> what, we, what we're really dealing with is that you have to really work also with the ancient knowledge in the sense of how, what it's really saying. So on the third dimension, if there's a triangulation that becomes a, a major source to all of our power, how does that manifest within the body? And we find that manifests in the mind, the body, and the soul. So if you approach the mind, body, and the soul as individual parts or vehicles of yourself, then you can start to repair them individually. So if you go into the mind, then of course you're going to need to remove a lot of the information or get to the closure of a lot of the information that is not the truth, because this will actually allow you to mentally repair your DNA. Because remember, DNA is only information. So junk DNA is having the wrong information. So now that you got the right information, you need to go through your mind and start moving out things that are just not true anymore, and then start coming to a full realization of what you're going to do next. So there you have the mind. With the body, it's very important as to, to know that you are what you eat. With all your vehicles, you are what you eat because everything is a consumption when you take it in. But personally, with the physical vehicle, when you eat something, 
like I said, blood earlier, or when you're eating um, uh, artificial food, then you become artificial as again, you are what you eat. And so this is a major key as far as the controllers are concerned, because they love to flood the body with things that create worms that keep you on certain frequencies and keep you from oscillating or vibrating high enough to shake off the shells or negative energies or basically the funk that has surrounded you as you're being immersed into a reality of ignorance. And so, as I said before, that this time becomes a big time for, for uh, the true enlightenment, not this fake uh, priesthood that's been running around the earth, giving everything but the answers. And that's one of the big keys because I think this program kind of spans out to about three hours, or excuse me, one hour and a half. Now that I'm looking at it on the timeline and you can see within an hour and a half, we pretty much covered uh, the, the major levels of truth and, you know, things that work for the mind body. And now we got to get into, of course, the soul and the soul itself is highly governed by its ties. Of course, the soul also has a correspondence with a lot of the ethereal objects such as magnets, crystals. So you can actually apply crystals or magnetic buffering to your, to your physical body in order to assist your soul. But in addition to that, you're also going to have to get a firm grounding because this is all about power. So grounding in this case is the, the negative that positive needs in order to, to actually fire off properly or to catalyze properly. So what you're going to need to do is you're going to need to become firmly grounded in what you know to be true and not waver every time someone comes up and tries to give you a, the, their version or, or their uh, misinterpreted version, meaning that with all of this, when you tell a person, look, especially if it's about their God dog or guard dog, as I call it, um, they'll always try to defend it. Instead of uh, the guard dog defending them, they actually are defending their guard dog or God. And so what happens is there becomes even a conflict within that. But the first thing that you have to do is work within you, the battlefield, as I said in the beginning of this conversation, is within. Then when people start seeing the actual correspondence and feeling the correspondence of their frequency change, then they automatically want to inherit what you have. So it's a general rule here. If you really activate it and if you're really about expanding people, that means that you've done it within. And then so automatically you're attracting or magnetizing, not chasing, not externalized, but attracting and magnetizing your frequency. And this is the biggest difference. This society wants to teach you to go outside for everything. But I'm telling you that the key is inside. It's with you. So as you look over the world, as I said, we went over about 7,000 years, something like that. And you look over the world and you see its growth. You have to ask yourself, has that been really growth? Or are we actually on the brink of true growth and expansion? Since especially, again, especially since the last 5,000 years has been built on us not even learning how to read and how to write. So I'm just going to take this time to, to make sure I look over my notes to, to be sure that I covered everything. And um, let's see here. I want to, again, encourage people to remember they're going to find another date after 2012 to tell you that everything is going to end. Don't believe it. Don't allow your energy to get drained and sucked up. Also, remember, again, Jesus on the cross, the cross is the axe. So it's the same thing with the axe cod and Zeus and all of that. And you have to be really careful because a lot of people are wrapped up and absorbed within these Druidic, Lamic, Papal priesthoods. And um, the best thing that you can do for them, if you understand that they won't budge from it, again, is to show them what's going on based on your action, not based on what you're saying to them, because at times they're veiled. And this is a literal spiritual, spiritual tense of an individual being their eyes and their spiritual eye being covered. Of course, the veil ultimately is the closing of the, the pineal gland, because with the pineal gland open, you can see everything. What happens, though, is through fear, which we, you know, it's all about the relationship with the fire God. Of course, the fire God wants you to fear and to be humble and to to be scared of hell and all these things. So what that does is it makes the pineal gland close. And then when the pineal gland closes, everything that you're seeing, you're only seeing through two eyes, which, of course, is duality. So everything becomes distorted. It becomes the knowledge of the tree of good and evil, or as, or as I call it, the, the tree, again, is the dual DNA. And so this dual DNA or a binary world or polarity of zero and one is what's short circuiting the corpus calypsum in your brain. 
So what this means is in the center of your brain, there's actually an area that's called the corpus callosum that lights up, as you've seen uh, Ang's corpus callosum light up on um, The Last Airbender. And that area in most people is burned out because of duality, meaning the constant back and forth of whether they're going to do it or not going to do it, whether they want it or don't want it, whether they like it or don't like it, and whether that one's good or that one's bad. Even uh, the activity of that, we have to understand, burns out the brain. So when you become harmonic, again, that goes with coming, going, excuse me, that goes with going inside. When you become harmonic, there becomes an entirely different boost to your energy system. And so what you find is you're able to shut out a lot of the whispering and a lot of the suggestions that are going on from the external reality. And then you're able to see the huge picture, the big picture, which is inside. And again, it's in your imagination or your image nation. And that's also the depth of the soul because the soul has never been seen like you can't see your soul in the external world because it's inside. So the only way that you're going to see your soul is to understand or to introspect and to go inside. And then you'll find the full realization of who you are. And of course, that's your everything. To the top of what the resistance has learned, especially in, in all the factions, the wholeness foundation that we represent, we've learned that all is self. And when we look at everyone, we see them only as a, only as a part of us on a different part of the timeline. Some of them, of course, are very primordial, still locked into the primordial goo part of us. And some are completely artificial and locked into the Borg or non-sensitive numeric side of us. What we need to find is we have to find balance. We have to also find a way to utilize what has taken place as our advantage. And I've also seen that in these times, if you actually began to be comfortable with who you are and who you've become, then all of what's happened in the past, you're able to take out those anchors. Meaning that when you hold a grudge or you're very upset about some things that have taken place in the past and you allow that energy and negativity to consume you, especially if another person is involved and they haven't apologized or rectified the situation, what you've still agreed to do is to remain in that time because every time you remember that, it takes you right to that reference point and then you're there again. So what we have to really see out of all of this is that we have now this opportunity to close the chapter on a major part of us basically just chasing our tails with good and bad duality and, and all these things and not going into the action. Now you see that there's not much put into the spiritual knowledge these days as far as something that's going to get you expanded. But I'll tell you, there is definitely something that is inside of you that's been put inside of you as your gift that can expand you. The knowledge of the, the body is with the breath. Again, it's with also consumption, what you put inside of it. It's not really on the outside. So you have to be very cautious of what you choose to take in and then at least make sure that the individuals that you take it in from have discovered wholeness. So I wanted to say that word to everyone, wholeness and balanced vibrations. I wanted to thank you for a wonderful year. Just it's so much expansion for me in the sense of being able to come to individuals every single day and deliver this message. So that, of course, puts me in a position of having to prepare for it. And in doing that, I've discovered so many things about this planet, this universe, myself, the solar system. And the only thing that I've wanted more is everyone else to know that and to not be in a level of ignorance because something has oppressed them for multiple lifetimes. And I feel like if I can do that, even for just a few individuals, even though we've now done it for thousands, that will equal the real awakening of this world, which to me is an organic grid something that functions like Orgone, where awake people, by simply being in proximity of others, begin to awake them up. I'm an extreme optimist because I've seen the, the power and the essence of the activated human. I've also seen how that is catchy, meaning that individuals that come in contact or touch individuals in high vibration also go into high vibration. So this lets me know that even within our children, we carry the key, what's carried is the key or a possible key to the activation of our entire reality. But instead of waiting on that, let us go into who we really are and start to handle this world and become adepts with the responsibility.
So once again, I want to say wholeness and balance vibration. My name is James Evans Bomar III. I'm the developer of the Planetary Resistance. It's been great. Happy 2012. And we're definitely looking forward to the 2013. And we're going to come out with even more energy and more strength than ever now that we're fully in the know.